Hey everyone, before we start the show, I just want to get some plugs out of the way. If you enjoy this podcast and you're into wrestling, check out the Nerds and Marks podcast or Marty and Sarah Love Wrestling. If you're not getting your fill on movie and entertainment discussion, then check out the Entertainment Buffet podcast. If you want to dive into the world of video games, I highly recommend the Dark Cast by my friends over at DarkStation.com. Listen to them cover important topics and interview men and women from all over the industry. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's shelved episode. I am your host, Jeremy Meyer. Okay, so before we jump into the show, I just want to get some plugs out of the way. Uh, First of all, for our social media, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Shelved Podcast. Uh, If you want to email us, send us a question, comment, anything like that, you can hit us up at shelvedfilmpodcast at gmail.com. I will answer any questions. We can have them on the show if you want to have them featured. If you want to keep your name secret, just let me know in case you're going to let in some industry secrets. Uh, Let me get a hit of my water here. I uh, hope that didn't come through too loud on the microphone there. But um, also, we have a Patreon now. If you want to head over to www.patreon.com slash shelved, we have a ton of rewards to offer for the show. If you want to pick our next script, there's a reward tier for that. If you just want to get a shout out, get something promoted on the show, there's a tier for that as well. Uh, some of the bigger uh, reward tiers are you can be a guest on the show. If you want to be a guest on the show, phone in. Uh, I'm actually going to have my first, fingers crossed, my first phone interview in uh, a week from now. Or actually, yeah, hopefully a week from now. Uh, should be next Friday. So I'm really excited about that. Um, it might have to go up earlier depending on if they need it up earlier because it is for promotion. So we'll see how that goes. But um, I'm not going to talk about that just yet. Not until hopefully it should be recorded early next week and we can have that um I'll let you know when when it's in the bag and I know what's happening. I don't want to jinx anything. I may have already said too much. But be sure to check out our Patreon and uh, check out those rewards. And you can get some really cool stuff. Uh, there's even some bonus episodes. We did the Star Wars commentary tracks. But maybe you want to hear us do the rest of the Star Wars movies since we only did the original trilogy. That's an option for you. You can go to the Patreon and submit to that tier and we'll cover those movies. All right, so pretty much got all the plugs out of the way. Also, be sure to review the show on iTunes, rate and review, give us five stars, let us know how we're doing. Um, I do have some digital codes for movies to give away, um, two that are not incredibly exciting, but movies that I love. Uh, I have a digital code for the new Power Rangers movie. I also have one for Fast and Furious 6. So if you leave us a five-star review on iTunes and email me the proof at shelledfilmpodcast at gmail.com, You can claim one of those codes, and it'll be first come, first serve. So sorry if you're looking for one and it gets taken. Uh, Sorry, you just weren't quick enough. But um, yeah, be sure to do that. All right, so let's let's get into this episode here. This is one that I was kind of dreading at first when I started reading the script. But I don't know why my voice went up like that. Script. But um, as it went on, it became a very interesting read, and it is a script based on one of my all-time favorite video game franchises. It's one I've been playing from the beginning. I have played every title in the franchise. I have not finished all of them. Uh, The fourth one I have played numerous times, but for some reason never played it to the end. I don't even know if I ever made it to the halfway point. Do you ever just have a game or a movie that you sit down, you start playing, you start watching it, you get, you know, a little bit into it, and then something happens, and you have to, like, step away, like... Oh, you lose your save data and you're like, oh, fuck, I'll play this later. Or like you have to go on an errand and you didn't get to finish the movie. And every time you keep coming back to it, something always gets in the way. That was the story for me for Devil May Cry 4, which uh, that's the franchise I'm talking about is Devil May Cry. Um, One started on the PlayStation 2 has continued on until PlayStation 3 and they just had the HD release on PlayStation 4. Hopefully we will see a new one soon. But it is a character action game based on the character of Dante, who is half human, half demon, and is a badass Matrix-style kung fu man who hunts demons. 
and it's an awesome at character action game similar to like god of war and you know god of war is most people's favorite game in that genre but for me it was always devil may cry i love the character of dante i love his snarkiness i love his design i mean it was very matrix inspired him dual wielding guns he's got a big ass sword um leather trench coat but very matrix-esque and he was just a really cool character versus Kratos is just angry all the time. And um, I don't know. I just I love the story and the lore behind the Devil May Cry games more than uh, God of War, which, um, you know, God of Wars has that interesting mythology. Just to me, they didn't use it interesting enough. Um, but Devil May Cry, it, it really worked for me. And the idea of them making a movie was always exciting to me in a way. So I am a big fan of video game movies. Um I watch all of them. I try to see them in theaters. I actually like a lot of them, which most people don't. Um, I have a ranking, I guess you would say, of there are four that I think that are legitimately good. And I know practically nobody will agree with me on this. But in order from one to four, for me, would be Mortal Kombat, uh, Assassin's Creed, which I think most people would cry boo at, um, Silent Hill, and Prince of Persia. Um, now those three, none of them are amazing. Like to me, Mortal Kombat's amazing, but, um, they're all, to me, they're all just good, fine movies. I wouldn't recommend them to anybody, but to me, I, I love them and I will turn up for almost any video game movie there is. I saw all of the Resident Evil movies, which are God awful. And I still hold on hope for a reboot. Um, actually recently there were, I guess they were working on a Resident Evil TV series, and I remember hearing a long time ago, uh, I saw this guy on the internet who claimed that he was a writer for some Resident Evil series and described it as like a detective story set in uh, Raccoon City. And recently, they somebody leaked or put out the pilot that they shot for the Resident Evil TV series, and they put it online, or it was like a proof of concept video or something. And it kind of matched what that guy was saying. And I'm wondering, like, oh, shit, was that the guy? And I was like kind of a dick to him. I was like, oh, yeah, man, I'll believe that when I see it. And, uh, he, you know, to me, it was like, oh, this just totally doesn't follow Resident Evil lore, blah, blah, blah. But then when I saw that video, I was like, oh, man, this is actually pretty interesting. And I would have watched this. And now I'm kind of looking back on that like, oh, man, did I shit talk that guy online because I didn't believe him. But if you're out there, if you if you put out that video and you're that guy, I'm sorry. And that video looked cool. And I would watch it because it's better than those movies. <laughs> um, so, I mean... The idea of a Devil May Cry movie, there was no chance that I think it would be good, but it's still something I would want to see. I would watch it. And I heard that there was a movie in development like a long time ago. I believe this script is dated. Let me see if I have it still on my iPad here. I had my notes pulled up. I want to say it was dated around 2006 to 2008 somewhere, which I believe the first Devil May Cry game came out in the early 2000s. Um but it's just, it, it seems like something, okay, I got the script for right here. Why don't I, I got to scroll back to the beginning. Um, it's dated for June of 2006 is when this draft was turned in. Written by Matthew Ian, oh God, Sir, uh, Cyrulnik, Cyrulnik, C-I-R-U-L-N-I-C-K. Yeah, sounds good. It says, based on the games Devil May Cry 1 through 3. Um, but I will say, nothing in this really reminds me of any of those Devil May Cry games. Um, okay, so why don't we jump in? So we open up in a church that is turned into a nightclub, because of course it is. And uh, we have Dante just at the bar, being the cool guy who is just kind of hanging out there, brooding, getting some drinks. Um, then we're also introduced to Sarah, who is Dante's friend, but she clearly wants to be more. Like, she's looking at him from inside the crowd and longingly and is disappointed when he sees a girl come up and he starts, like, noticing that girl. Uh, so, well, first Sarah tries to get him to come dance, and he doesn't want to dance. So he's, she's just like, all right, just come and brood at the bar then. Uh, but this blonde girl comes up and orders a couple drinks, and he drinks one because he was trying to place an order, and the bartender was ignoring him. Uh, and he, he puts some moves on the girl at the bar, and turns out she has a boyfriend, and he comes and gets in Dante's face. And he has a line that is just real rough. Um, like, I remember this is 2006. Times are a little more different then. But um, the, the guys come, like, gets in his face, and Dante is like, whoa, I don't swing that way, man. I think gay night's here on Thursday. And I was just kind of one of those ugh, groaning lines. Um, but all those dudes' punk friends surround him, and 
He, he says something along the lines of this chick isn't worth the amount of pain you guys are about to go through. And then Dante beats the shit out of all these guys. Um, so right away establishing, you know, he's a punk. And, um, they, you know, he, it's all going well until he sees one of them pulling out a gun. So then him and Sarah disappear into the crowd. You know, they run outside. They hop into a car. She's got like a nice Porsche. Um, and it, it's pretty much imp- said that her dad is must be this rich guy and gets her all these nice things so he doesn't have to actually spend time with her. Uh, so they, they speed away and run away from these guys to an all-night diner. And then we cut to inside the diner. They're just hanging out. And he, she just straight up asks, like, why he won't make a move on her. And he makes it pretty clear that uh, she's his only friend and he doesn't want to ruin that friendship. Like, as much as there's clearly sexual tension between that two, he's kind of a loner, but she's the one, you know. And he's going to try to make that last. So she drops him off at his motorcycle. And we get a little more sexual tension. And he, you know, she kisses him on the cheek. And, you know, he takes off. He goes home. Uh, he gets home. And we see, we experience his nightmares, which is going to be a recurring theme throughout the movie. So he has a nightmare where he's walking down, like, a fleshy hallway. Think of a hallway made of, like, skin that's bleeding or something. They don't really describe it. But I picture basically, like, throbbing walls that look like hu- human muscle. Uh, and he it goes all the way down to a room full of candles, and then one candle blows out, and Dante wakes up. Uh, so Dante, he sketches his dream, uh, and it shows that he has a bunch of notebooks full of sketches, something that he's been experiencing for years. Uh, he's just having these nightmares since he was a child. Uh, we see a depiction of like a, a monster with a giant eye, and then the next thing you know, we are introduced introduced to mundus who if you've played the video games if you know anything about the video games mundus is the uh, main villain of the video games he's like the leader of the demon world but in this he's a uh, he's like a pale man with uh, tattoos all over his body because movies um so he he goes up to a man who's very pale has some black eyes a bunch of call girls throwing parties and uh, he holds up a lighter, and he's basically like calling upon his service. And they show him looking at this man through the lighter, and you see he's through the fire. It shows his true form, which is kind of like a demon. And then he cl- Mundus closed the lighter, and the man disappears. And then we cut to the Middle East in a prison cell, and Mundus does the same thing to a woman. So this is kind of his second demon. And then he tells her that he plans to shatter the barrier between the realms. And then she, you know, reveals her demon self and disappears. He then steps through the prison door and enters into New York. And he meets his next demon and tells him that when he's taken the world and killed the last of Sparta's bloodline, then this man can return to what he does. Because he mentions that he knows that this demon has some women locked up and he's going to need his service for now. And then he can go back to his locked up women. Uh, So we got water there. So I just had bacon, so I'm a little uh, a little dry. Um, okay, so we th- he, we see him through his lighter again. We get this little fancy cut of through the fire. We cut to Dante lighting an incense, and he's uh, talking to Sarah on the phone. And she asks when he's ever going to talk about the nightmares, and you know he kind of tells her about it a little bit. And then we see that Dante has a Polaroid on his fridge, which shows his dad, his real dad, and clearly he's alone now. And then from his dad, we see that he has a sword um, in the picture, and Dante has the same sword in his closet. And, you know, kind of a weird thing, like, oh, this sword left me by my dad. So what does he do? He takes it up onto the roof, and we get this odd voiceover about how his dad left him, and all he has is this sword, and the sword has this writing on it, and he practices with the sword on the roof, because, you know, I guess that's what you do. Uh, so then we cut to them in class. And we have the uh, teacher giving, you know, history lesson. And Dante's clearly got this too cool for school vibe, but uh, it's it's more of a he's actually too smart for school. Like him and Sarah basically compete about who knows more. So it's a little bit of a different approach on it. But um, they actually name drop the Illuminati as the ruling force of the world. And I wasn't sure if that was a joke or not. But it definitely feels like uh, this movie was like the Dragon Ball Evolution School of Screenwriting. Because, oh, let's take our main character and put him in school. Because what else do you do with these young characters? And it just just doesn't work. It doesn't fit Dante. I mean, when you meet Dante in the video games, literally a demon just bursts into his office, his place called Devil May Cry. um, And he starts fighting. 
and then he gets hired for a job and that's that's it uh there's no like oh you know he went to school and blah blah, blah. even when they came back with uh, devil may cry 3 and the remake which were more origin stories for dante it was never he was in school it was just he was dante and he did these things and you didn't ask questions but you still learned about the character and it's always just been more about dante's family um which will come up a little later uh so yeah uh, they even name dropped the villain in the scene uh, which is just like in dragon ball evolution it's like oh everybody hears everybody knows the story of piccolo and in this everybody knows that mundus is the leader of the demon realm um so we cut to a diner after class uh, a newspaper that one of the people is reading uh, shows a politician that went missing and it's one of the same demons that mundus went and saw um and dante it's the same uh, diner that they went to after the club and dante is eating there and all of a sudden he starts shaking doesn't know why and mundus just shows up right next to dante and he just tells him he's a dead ringer for his father and Dante is kind of like, hey, who the, who the fuck are you, dude? And he touches them, and all of a sudden he gets like a flash of like hallucinations, like kind of back to his dreams. Um, so Mundus leaves, and he follows Mundus out, and he's trying to get answers. Uh, but he kind of comes off a little drunk because he's like screaming like a madman, and you know he's still kind of weary from the hallucination. Uh, so he follows him out into the alley, but the people who work at the restaurant run out, and they accuse him of stealing. And uh, two cops kind of who are on the sidewalk, they show up and Mundus just kind of disappears when Dante turns around and Dante just blacks out. And then he wakes up on a rooftop covered in blood with the word Sparta written on the wall. Um, So Dante heads home and he tries watching off the blood like he's freaking out. And he sees on the news report that uh, somebody's mentioning two cops that were brutally murdered in an alleyway. And he turns off the TV freaking out and he sees his reflection in the TV and his hair is now silver matching the character from the video games, which in Devil May Cry, the remake, he did not have the silver hair. It was only when he went into his devil trigger mode, which is something we will talk about later in the script. Um, Okay, so the waitress that we cut back to the diner and um, we meet Detective Kinder, who was investigating the crime scene. Uh, the waitress says she knows Dante and points him into the direction of where he hangs out on the roof. She, you know, she sees him up there with the sword and they're like, this fucking guy killed this dude and you didn't think that it was weird that he hangs out with a sword. And she was just like, well, he's never bothering anybody. Um, so then we cut back to Dante's apartment. He's on the phone with Sarah telling her, you know, he's freaking out. Uh, he tells her about meeting Mundus and the language on his tattoos and the fact that it matches his sword and matching his visions. And the word Sparta, which she recognizes, so she starts digging through books. But he notices that the police are basically about to bust in. Uh, So they agree to meet at the park. And that's when the police burst in and one shoots at Dante, but somehow he manages to dodge a bullet. Like, surprisingly, all of a sudden he's got super speed. And he he steals a cop's gun, barricades himself in his kitchen, and then kind of just starts shooting at them to distract them. Uh, So he's pretty much trapped in his kitchen, but he notices on his wall... There's a spot where a uh, dumb waiter used to be. The thing, you know, the shelves that would rise up and down in a building so they could deliver things from floor to floor. So he uses the gun to shoot out the wall. And then he uh, dives into the shaft, but he ends up getting stuck and all cut up and stuff. But he decides he just starts punching into the metal and he punches all the way through into another apartment's kitchen. And suddenly he has this super strength. It's just all of a sudden his powers are manifesting. So Dante starts, uh, he hops out the window, starts running down the fire escapes, but there are snipers on the building across uh, trying to shoot at him. But while they're aiming, Mundus's three minions show up and throw the three snipers off the roof. Dante doesn't see this, of course, but he uh, sees a truck coming down the street and he jumps off the fire escape onto the truck. Uh, So Detective Kinder is examining Dante's home, finds his sketches, and when he finds them, he seems something familiar about them, like... He recognizes them. Uh, so Dante meets Sarah, and she shows him a book by an author named Toynbee. Is T O Y N B E E? It's the only way I can think to describe it. Uh, which talks about a demon disguised as a man named Sparta, and the Knights of Saint John, who are the knights that hunt demons. So as they're in the park, Kinder gets the drop on Dante, and Sarah manages to escape on the bus, but Dante is arrested. Uh, He gets brought to the police station, and all the cops just kind of want to beat his ass. Like, come on, man, leave him with us. We want to take care of him. And Kinder, he seems to be looking out for Dante. He's like, no, no, can't let you do that. He's a prisoner. You guys, like, obviously that would be a bad thing. 
So he puts Dante in the interrogation room and starts talking to him. And he's like trying to get him to confess. And it was at this point where this script was kind of reminding me of Blade Trinity, which is never what you want to be reminded of. But it did make me think of like this. This could have been like Blade. Like if you wanted to, to make this movie, you could have made it like Blade and it could have been Blade but demons. And I think it would have been a way more entertaining movie and a, a better approach to that idea. Um, so Dante is introduced to his lawyer, whose name is uh, Purse. I think it's how you P-E-R-S-E, Pierce, but it doesn't isn't spelled like Pierce. But uh, he comes in and, you know, Kinders leaves the room and lets Purse uh, sit in there. And Dante tries to talk to him, but Purse just keeps staring at him. Uh, Purse takes a pill and then waits a second. And then he looks at Dante and then looks back to Kinder through the two-way mirror and gives him like a little nod. So Kinder starts leading Dante out of the police station where the cops, they see them trying to leave, but the cops attack him. But Kinder helps by drawing his gun, holding the cops off. They usher Dante into a Rolls Royce and they start leaving. And Dante, you know, he's asking a bunch of questions like, what the fuck is going on? What are you doing with me? But Sarah shows up and she crashes her car into the Rolls Royce and helps him escape. They, uh, but he gets hit with a sedative. Uh, They put, they get him a sedative while they're going in, while they have him in the car. So they, they run and they escape into a subway and they manage to get on a train. But Dante, he's like passing out. Uh, she has a stuff, his bag with a sword in it. Um, but yeah, so Dante passes out and he just kind of like falls asleep on her lap as she strokes his hair as the train goes. So then we cut to maybe the worst scene of the script that is Catwoman basketball scene levels of bad and is almost kind of the same thing like it was so similar that it made me want to look up the Catwoman movie to see if this guy wrote it but we see Mundus and he uh, comes across a bunch of hooligans playing soccer a bunch of kids and um, he offers if he can beat them then he gets their souls so we have a scene of Mundus playing soccer and then uh, some cops show up they recognize Mundus from the woman at the diner's Uh, description and he fucking kicks the ball into a cop's head and it crushes his head and he kills the cop and then he uh, punches through the other one's chest so yeah that is just a fucking batshit ridiculous scene there's an old movie it was like an 80s horror movie where a girl throws a basketball at her mom's head and it just explodes like it's like that and catwoman mixed together which is just like come on what are you pulling from (laughs) Um, so Dante wakes up in Toynbee's library. She was able to get him there and he tells him that he knew his father. And at this point I was like, this is kind of like if Blade met Constantine, which would have been a much better movie because that's kind of what Devil May Cry is. Uh, so Toynbee was part of a demon hunting order. He was part of the Knights of St. John and so were the cops that are chasing him. But he left because of Sparta, because of Dante's dad. Um, the writing on the sword, basically he did, has... Um, translated it is the word I'm looking for and it tell, basically tells Dante to follow in his father's fo- uh, footsteps and he tells Dante that they you know they were chasing Sparta and they caught him one night and he noticed that when Sparta was attacking the knights that he wasn't killing any of them he was only injuring them he was going out of his way to make sure they lived uh, pause for water but um, it um uh, so they end up capturing Sparta and um, he he's says that, you know, they executed him. Uh, so then we cut to Mundus has the kids robbing a store, but for some reason he just has these possessed kids robbing a store and some of them get killed and he takes their souls. And I don't even know what the scene has to do with anything because it never really comes up again. So we see the flashback of uh, Sparta fighting the knights and Toynbee helping capture him, but Sparta tells him how he trapped Mundus and was hunting demons. So Sparta had already defeated Mundus at one point and trapped him and was hunting demons that had escaped into the real world. But, you know, he gets caught up by the knights of St. John. Uh, So Toynbee gives Dante some pills and tells him that this is how they see demons. And if he wants to see himself or how he truly is, he can take the pills too. Uh, so we already saw how Purse had taken these pills before. But this is when the house is attacked and Toynbee is killed. The Knights of St. John have tracked them to this house and they come in a guns blazing. Uh, so Dante and Sarah escape and Kinder reveals himself killing Toynbee and finding the picture of Sparta. So he knows now who Dante is, that he is the son of Sparta. 
uh, Dante and Sarah, they hide out in a motel where Sarah reads the translations of his sword, which is basically kind of just this movie starts to turn into um, national treasure. And I love that as I'm getting further and further into this, it's just becoming more and more like other things. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, yeah, it's like that. Um, so it just kind of turns into some real sketchy puzzle solving. And uh, they find out that his sword is named Rebellion. And the <laughs> inscription mentions two guns, which is just fucking ridiculous. Um, there's some real sketchy puzzle solving involving the time he was born and the north clock face of Big Ben. So basically, there's just this poem that they have to decipher. And, and they basically find out that um, at a certain time, Big Ben points in a certain direction and they decide it's oh it's his birthday so that's the time they use um and it leads them to a uh, museum like it points to a museum on the map um so the the guy who runs the hotel or the motel that they're in he sees their picture in the paper and he goes up there with a shotgun to stop him even though he's already called the police but all of a sudden he is killed by rebellion Like, the sword just kind of flies out of the room. And Dante has another one of his blackouts, and he wakes up and he's talking to Mundus, who says, it'll end soon with one of them dead. And this is kind of, this is the thing that kind of bothers me, is this is the second time Dante has blacked out and supposedly killed somebody, and they never really reveal if it's him or Mundus. Like, it's one of those things where you feel like, oh, you know, our hero is not going to be a stone-cold killer. He's going to, it's going to be eventually revealed that Mundus was, like, controlling him or something. It just never comes up again. So basically we're left the idea of Dante lost control of his devil side and killed these people. Like, sorry. Um, So they saw these clues and it points them to the London Museum. Uh, But she says they should wait until it's crowded because more people wouldn't notice them. And I'm sorry, at this point they're basically like fugitives. And if everybody's looking for them, would waiting for it's crowded for more people to recognize them be such a good idea? (laughs) Um, So we get them and they're... uh, they're entering the museum and Sarah gets flagged because she's, she's carrying a fucking sword in a bag. We're like, look, lady, like you can't have this in here. But she's like, oh, it's for it's for a school project or whatever. So they just let her go in, which is ridiculous. Um, so they scour the museum and they find basically an exhibit for um, Sparta. But it's it's done under the guise of like a different name. It's like Sparta backwards. It's like Lord Adraps or something. And, um I just so they're like looking through these things and they find out that the paintings are it's it's all about specifically the way the exhibit is laid out like she's reading uh inscription and it's like oh you know he had it specifically laid out uh, on purpose it was all like oh like the artifacts have to go in this order so they find out they have to follow the signs and like paintings are pointing and looking in directions <laughs> it leads them to an exhibit of guns and I just can't take a fucking prophecy seriously when it's like guns, when they're supposed to be in ancient times fighting demons. Like this isn't a museum and nobody finds it weird. There's like, Oh, along with swords and ancient Renaissance paintings, there are guns and it's just, it's a little ridiculous. It's a little va- video gamey. Um, I know this world is a little odd, but it's like, come on. Like you name drop the Illuminati. That was enough for me. I didn't need it. Guns to be some ancient thing. Uh, so They also find out that one of the paintings will have the next message in it. So their idea is like, well, we're about to set off the alarm. And they take the painting and bust the guns out. And um, Kinder, Purse, and five other of the knights appear. And they start attacking Dante. But as this is happening, Mundus' demons also appear. And so as they're running and fighting, Mundus' minions enter... And Dante's running from them as one of them fights the cops. So then Dante is left to fight two of them. And he pulls out the guns to finally find out what's what. And turns out, like, these guns are basically like, oh, they're like infinite ammo guns. But they only work on demons. It's basically like Dante's power that fuels them. Because later he tries to use one against one of the knights and it doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, we literally get a scene where he is levitating one of the demons with his guns. Just shooting them so much they're floating in the air. Which is straight out of the video games. Um... He finds like a hole in the ground that leads into an underground tunnel. So he chases them into a tunnel and a train comes and he runs up the wall 
and flips onto the train. So like out of nowhere, all of a sudden they're just kind of introducing the action and acrobatics of the video game. Um, so he chases them into the tunnel. Well, okay. So Dante, he, you know, he's avoided the train. Uh, he busts open the painting and finds that the note has the names of the guns, Ebony and Ivory, because we have to name drop all the video game stuff. And this is some of the stuff that bothers me the most. in um, Video game movies is just the pandering to the games. It's something that the Resident Evil movies have done so much of, hey, we're like, okay, so Resident Evil Retribution is one of the most frustrating movies in the world to me because, for one, throughout that entire series, you're never really introduced to characters. It's like they throw characters in the movie from the games and you get their name, but there's no characterization. You're just supposed to care about them because it's the character from the video game that you like. And the resident evil retribution is the most in the one before it, uh, afterlife, I think is, so that's the fourth and fifth movie. Um, they're the most guilty of this where in the fourth movie, the zombies turn into a different kind of monster that is from a different video game that is not based on the zombies that the zombies were based on from the original video game. It's like a totally separate monster and there's no throwaway line in the movie of like, Oh no, the virus has mutated them. They've evolved. It's something you just kind of have to figure out for yourself. But I even listened to the DVD commentary to see if they would be like, Oh yeah, we just implied that they mutated and people would figure it out. Now they're just like, Oh, we threw it in there. Cause it's from the video game. And it's so much. So in the fifth movie, there's a scene where Michelle Rodriguez's character injects something into her neck and Leon Kennedy's that character from the video games is just like, it's the lost Plagas parasite, which is something from the fourth game, which is completely unrelated to all the zombie shit from the first three games. And nobody would fucking know what that is. And it was the most frustrating thing. And is why that movie literally, I was just getting offended watching that movie. Um, and that's kind of what this is doing. Like, oh, we have the guns, Ebony and Ivory, and like, you don't need to name drop the guns and the sword. Like, we know what they are. Just have them in there. Um, maybe just flash the names on the side of the guns. You don't need to explain it to me. Um, like maybe they're carved into the side. Okay. So it turns out Kinder was following Dante, but Dante gets the drop on him. Like he literally drops on him from the top of the train station. And, uh, Kinder says that he's the one who killed Sparta. And Dante obviously wants to kill him, but he tells Dante he's not afraid to die. But then Dante starts asking him questions and Kinder's just answering. It's like, if you're not afraid to die, why aren't you saying just kill me? But instead he literally answers all of Dante's questions. And Dante asks him if he can be killed since he's part demon. And Kinder says he can be killed only through ritual. Uh, So Dante finally gets his matrix coat and he uh, takes the coat off of Kinder. And now he's got his leather coat, which... In the games, it was a red leather coat. In this, I'm just going to assume it's black because I feel like if uh, it was a red leather coat that Kinder was wearing, for one, that would be weird because who wears a red leather coat? But two, I feel like they would have called it out because they've pandered every other thing from the video games. Why wouldn't they do that? But um, So Dante takes Kinder hostage, and Kinder is curious as to why Dante killed a demon because Dante tells him, I was like, look, you think I'm this bad guy, but I didn't kill you guys. I actually killed one of them. So whose side am I on? So uh, Dante wants him to take him to uh, take him to Kinder's house. Uh, but as they're, you know, walking down the streets, they get spotted on a camera. This takes place in London. So um, there, you know, there are CCTV cameras all over the place. Um, and then the cops swarm them. Uh, Dante jumps into the river. And he steals a police boat by, like, swimming around and jumping onto a boat and Matrix fighting everybody off. And then he gets back to the shore and just kind of tails Kinder to his house. Um, And Kinder kind of gets in his house and Dante just shows up and is like, no, where were we? And so we end up at Stonehenge because the the Knights of St. John have Sarah. And they're going to sacrifice her for being allied with the demon. And apparently they're going to do this at Stonehenge. Um, so Dante leads or uh, Kinder leads Dante to the ceremony and uh, he um, ties Kinder to a tree. But then Dante goes there and kind of just out of nowhere becomes the typical badass. Like he's he's fighting all these men and beats them all up, uh, make sure he doesn't kill any of them, but is wounding them with a sword and stuff. Um, and then he ends up just cutting Kinder loose and just like, look, remember this. 
Uh, so Dante reveals the note to Sarah, which says that he needs to find a key and a map that'll lead him to uh, the demon world. And this ends up leading them to a sacred heart church, which of course, another church. <laughs> um, so they, uh, they go into this church and he knows that he has to defeat Mundus in the demon realm. And then this will lock him away. And at this point, this is kind of just becoming overly complicated. So they go to the church and, uh, they're trying to find their way. They have it. They've, have a clue from the thing which they think is relative to a statue so he breaks the statue and kind of has the one uh line in the script that made me laugh where he's just like well i'm going to hell because the statue really wasn't what they needed and it's like obviously he is going to be going to hell later uh sorry time for a water break Uh, sorry if that's coming through on the microphone okay but then they find they notice that there's um basically like a a crack in the wall or like a hole in the wall like it is hollow behind the wall because of some um what's it called like a mural is on the wall and it's something's a little off in this one area so they break into it and they find nothing just an empty room or an empty crypt even but instead dante meets one of the nuns there who we find out is his mother and so we're, we're almost 80 pages into this script and we have very little answers to anything that's been going on. Um, namely things that just never come up again. Um, it's, we never learn why Dante went crazy, why these people were killed, anything like that. Um, but Dante's kind of mad at his dad for being an awesome father. Like his mom is telling him, um, uh, that basically, you know, they met, they fell in love, they had him, but sparta couldn't keep them both safe so he took dante with him and they would just kind of wander and send her notes from time to time and he was trying to protect dante but then he got caught and killed and dante is mad at him for abandoning him but it's like he didn't abandon you he died so like it, it doesn't make sense for him to be this like mad child at his dad when his dad was actually kind of being awesome and trying to protect him Um, So the mother tells him where he needs to go and that there's a castle that holds a portal between worlds. So it's worth pointing out that in the first Devil May Cry video game, the entire video game takes place in a castle. Um, So to me, this is the part where I'm getting exciting. And this is honestly the best part of the movie. Like from here on out, I actually really enjoyed this. The problem is it took until the third act for me to actually like this. For the most part, it was just kind of boring. Um, and it wasn't Devil May Cry, but now it starts to feel like it. So they uh, journey to this gorge that she, uh, it's like a montage of them traveling across the country. And it leads them to this gorge. And Sarah's just like, hey, we just have to jump down. Like, we have to have faith. So they jump down in this gorge, and then that leads them to a forest. And then they start making their way through the forest. And then they, they camp out, and then they share some feelings. And then they hook up because, you know, that's what you do. You got your man, you got your woman. They're going to hook up uh, before they get in their life and death situation. So Dante wakes up early and he kind of goes to this pond that they're camped out by. And all of a sudden, Mundus appears to entice Dante. And Dante sees himself for who he is. He takes one of the pills and looks into the water reflection and sees himself as a demon. And then Mundus shows up and is basically like telling him like you know, you're not your father. Like he was able to beat me. You're only half demon. And it's basically teasing him before their encounter. Uh, but Dante, she, he wakes up Sarah and they work their way through the clearing or through the forest into a clearing, but there is no castle, but there are like five helicopters full of the knights. But the problem is a bunch of demons also appear and the minions appear and they start fighting off the knights. And so does uh, Dante starts fighting off the minions. Um, Sarah hides behind a rock and just happens to find the keyhole for Dante's amulet, which I forgot to mention. The mom gave him an amulet, which is a key. And apparently there's just like a rock where you got to put the amulet in. So he throws her the amulet. She inserts it and a tower erupts out of the ground and carries them into the sky as he fights the demons. So I guess I guess this is kind of similar to Devil May Cry 3. There was a big tower. Um, that's kind of the only thing they borrow from Devil May Cry 3, which is the best of the Devil May Crys in my opinion. 
I should point out that the character of Virgil, who is Dante's brother in the video games, makes no appearance in this, even though he appears in all three video games. There is kind of a reference to him, but we will get to that in a little bit. Um, okay. So, where was I? Okay, a tower erupts out of the ground, carries him into the fight. Um, Dante and Sarah enter from the top of the tower, and the knights enter from the bottom. So everybody's kind of running around until they meet into the middle. They all stumble upon each other, and all the knights are killed because Kinder ends up believing in Dante. So it kind of turns into a Mexican standoff with Dante and some of the knights. But Dante convinces Kinder that they're actually on the same side, and Kinder shoots some of his knights' brothers to help Dante. Um, so they st- uh, come to the portal room, and Dante opens a portal by lighting the candle from his dreams. Because remember the candle in the fleshy tunnel? This is the room. <laughs> um, but uh, but it turns out that Sarah, she's a demon traitor. She steals Dante's stuff, and she enters the portal. And Kinder, uh, he's been injured at this point. I think he got shot during the standoff, but then he also uh, he gets stabbed by a demon. But um, so Dante and Kinder enter into the demon realm, and this is something I like. It's this is kind of all awesome. <laughs> um, so it, when they go into the demon realm, the castle is the same. It's just like you know, you look out the windows, and it's like a scorched earth type situation, and everything's just kind of a twisted version. So there was a moment where they were passing by a bunch of statues that looked like giant marionette puppets, which are enemies from the video game, and when they enter the demon world, they're all real. So. Dante and Kinder are fighting these marionettes, and he ends up um, defeating all of them. But Kinder gets really severely injured, and he has to go back, and he's going to wait in the portal entrance room. So Dante continues. At this point, you remember, he has no weapons. Like, he kind of took some stuff from one of the marionettes, like a sword, and that's kind of what he's working with. Um, so Dante next runs into another video game character. Uh, and literally at this point, this movie becomes a video game because he fights a giant crystal dog, which is from the third video game. And it's where you get a weapon. Called, it's a three headed dog and it's where you get a weapon called Cerberus. And it's a like three headed chain weapon with uh, light uh, ice and like fire damage and stuff. And literally the scene is described just like the fucking video game where he can see the weapon inside the dog because the dog is made out of crystals. And um. He jumps all over the room using his super speed and jump ability and is knocking down stalactites until they fall onto the dog and shatter him. And then he gets a weapon. So now he's actually got a weapon. Um, So Dante moves into the next area. um, And he fights some Grim Reapers from the video game, which are some of the main enemies you fight in, I think, Devil May Cry 3. But it's just these like ghost reaper looking things and he's fighting them with a Cerberus and taking them all out until he leads into this next room, which is a hall of mirrors because you got to have some twisted fucking hall of mirrors in a movie like this. And this is where he fights a knight. So when they go into the demon realm, three of the demons, uh, the, like the three main ones that were kind of Mundus's minions throughout the movie. When they entered the, d- the demon world, they all transformed into these different monsters. One turned into the dog, one turned into uh, a knight. And this knight, I believe, is a reference to Virgil. Because in the lore of Devil May Cry, Virgil is Dante's twin brother. And then before I get into this, let me take a water break. Okay. So Virgil is Dante's twin brother. Uh, they look the same. They have the silver hair, except Virgil uh, slicks his back, wears a blue coat instead of a red coat. And Devil May Cry 3 is the story of Dante versus Virgil, and so is the remake. Uh, I think it's handled very well in the remake of where they are teamed up the whole time until the end of the game where Virgil becomes the final boss because they want different things. Um, but Devil May Cry 3 it is Dante versus Virgil, and it ends with Virgil trapped in the demon realm. And then he becomes a slave to Mundus, and he is turned into a, like, black encased armor knight. And I believe this knight character is supposed to be a reference to that, although he's never really addressed as such. He doesn't even really look the same. But he does have this cool power. They're in the Hall of Mirrors, and the knight is able to run through the mirrors, and he just kind of keeps popping out and striking Dante from different points. 
Um, but I like how it works because the uh, knight runs out of the mirror. And as that's happening, Dante runs into the mirror. And the knight becomes super confused. And then Dante strikes from out of nowhere and ends up killing him. Uh, so I really like that. And then so we cut to Mundus's chamber and he's talking to Sarah, who we find out is his daughter. And he's kind of taunting her about, you know, being at his side and realizing her potential. But she betrays him. She decides that she still cares very much for Dante. And she steals his weapon and strikes Mundus with it, but then runs away to bring him back to Dante. And so she she brings it to him. And he's fighting. Like uh, She tells Dante the final inscription on the sword. And how he needs to, it says he needs to become a full demon to kill Mundus. And he just kind of doesn't really believe her. Like he, she, th- he thinks she's a traitor and just is still trying to trick him. But he takes his weapons and he fights a room full of million- minions like the games. Like he's launching them into the air, jumping, shooting, and levitating with the gunfire, running off the wall, throwing the sword. Like they literally describe all of the moments from the games. So this is supposed to be, hey, here's the devil may cry, you know. And honestly... I, I kind of fucking love it. Like, this was a really fun scene to read and picture. And um, it would be one of those moments. It's kind of like when you watch the Power Rangers movie. Um, the end of it is what you're there for. And this is kind of the same thing. Like, throughout three-fourths of this script, it never feels like Devil May Cry. But the last 20 minutes absolutely does. And I actually really love that part. Um, so Dante, he finishes fighting all these demons. And he enters the final chamber where Mundus is waiting. Uh, So, you know, it doesn't really describe much of their fight, but it's basically just like, oh, they fight and they fight. And um, Dante ends up getting stabbed and he basically lets himself die. But then when he dies, he arises in his demon form. Now, if you've if you've played the video games, one of the um, abilities you have is you can hit your little L1 button and Dante goes into a uh, what they call the devil trigger mode, where he enters his devil form and becomes more powerful, becomes faster, and fights with more demonic weapons. And basically, this part is a reference to that. So it's Dante fighting Mundus as a demon. And uh, they end up going into a room of uh, pitch blackness. And then as he's fighting him there, he knocks Mundus down into a lava pit. And Dante, his sword actually gets knocked into the lava, which he just reaches into. And they describe him having a skeleton hand as he pulls out the sword. And Dante ends up killing Mundus. And Mundus falls into the lava. Um, So Dante ends up getting back into the chamber of the main room. And for no reason whatsoever, he is back in his human form. It's, It's never explained. It's just, oh, yep, you know, he's a human now. And now they have to escape uh, the tower because now that, of course, Mundus is destroyed, the tower is going to collapse. And so the tower starts falling, falling, falling. And um, they they need to escape. So, you know, he, he takes Sarah, you know, kind of has believed her now. And they run back to the portal room where Kinder is. And they all escape into the real world and outside of the tower. And as the tower collapses into the ground and into the demon world portal, they see some demons escape from the portal and into the real world, which is something they, that they mentioned would happen. You know, if Mundus is killed, then some of these demons would escape. Um, and then we we get a little bit of a time jump. So we cut to a little later. Uh, Dante, before we do that, Dante vows that he will kill the demons. And Kinder actually tells him, Look, we, we actually didn't kill Sparta. Um, they mentioned earlier that, uh, except for, aside from killing Dante, because Kinder was suggesting, like, maybe we'd take an alternate path because um, Dante, he did kind of believe that maybe Dante was one of the good ones, so maybe they could take an alternate path. And he told them that that alternate path is they can perform a ritual that basically freezes them as a stone statue. And that this is actually what they did with Sparta. That he's not dead. So Dante vows that he's going to find his dad and free him. And he's also going to hunt the demons that escaped. So then we cut to Dante has a little bit of a shithole shop. And it's him, his mom, and Sarah. And they are 
cleaning up this shop as Dante is just kind of loafing around. And Dante gets a call. And it's Kinder on the phone who says that they have a lead on a demon. and But they also have a lead on Sparta. And so Dante is ready to head out. So him and Sarah load up on his motorcycle and they take off. And the final, the final image is a candle burning. And we zoom into the flame and we see Mundus trapped inside, trapped in the demon world. And then we cut to credits. So at the end, we do kind of get a little bit of a moment of, hey, Dante has this shop built. He's going to hunt demons here. But <laughs> there is never a reference of them calling it Devil May Cry, which is the name of his shop. Like, honestly, the whole point of Devil May Cry 3 is, oh, he's got a shop. What's he going to call it? And at the end, he's like, I'm going to call it Devil May Cry, uh, which I think is a line of dialogue in the movie, in the game at some point. And so it's a reference to that and his brother and all that kind of stuff. But <laughs> this movie uh, doesn't really address any of that um but that's it that's that's the devil may cry script um it was it was more entertaining than i expected um i don't think it would be a good movie uh i think it, it could be this is kind of one of the first scripts i've read or of like this could be a bad movie that i like like this could be one of those movies like oh that was terrible but i love it because it was terrible because it does sound like, it, let's say it was made right. Let's say it had a great director that made a very fun, stylish-looking movie. But it followed the script. I would look at it and be like, yeah, the story kind of sucks. Um, a good chunk of the movie is a little boring. Uh, it panders to fans, but holy shit, that last 30 minutes, man. Like, that's why you go. And honestly, like I said, it's it's similar to the Power Rangers movie. Uh, I'm just going to keep comparing this to other movies. It's like if Power Rangers met Blade and Constantine and they all were rolled into one movie. And honestly, that sounds like an awesome idea, but it just it doesn't work so much on paper. If they took that last 30 minutes and just expanded that style, I think it could have been awesome. Like I I think it should have been like Blade. He should have been introduced and just already kind of been this badass and because if you think back to Blade, like there's no origin story for Blade. It's just he shows up at that club and starts killing vampires and you learn more about him as the movie goes. And I think that is the way to handle this. And you cut out all the school bullshit like you cut out that stuff that clearly fans would not like. And you just do it as like an awesome action movie. Um, and I think it could I think it could be a great movie. It's I mean, it, it shows that they never made this. And at this point, I do believe there is another Devil May Cry movie in the works that is supposed to follow the original game or the new game, the remake. Uh, so and which is a great fucking story. I love that game way more than I expected to. Um, so if they stick close to that model, I think it could be a awesome movie, a lot of fun, especially because that movie or that video game, I mean, does a lot of cool things about jumping between the real world and the demon world and, like, how you get pulled in and you have to find your way out, like, multiple times. It also shows how the real world gets twisted into kind of the mirror world that is the demon world, and that's, like, a lot of awesome visual cues and, like, some awesome visual ideas. So I do think you could make a Devil May Cry movie. That would be awesome, but I just don't think this script would have been it. Uh, like I said, a fun 30 minutes that you would show up for and be like, I like it for that. I'd like to see what they do in a sequel, but they would probably never end up making a sequel because it wouldn't make money because video game movies generally don't. Uh, at this point, there is Tomb Raider coming out in March that is following the reboot of that game, which was also fantastic. And those trailers look a lot of fun. I hope that's good. So I don't know. Maybe I always say it, but maybe we're ready to turn a chapter, turn over a new chapter for video game movies. But that's going to be it for today's episode. That is Devil May Cry. Um, next week will probably be... I've been writing this long, long analysis on the Justice League movie. And I'm currently in the middle of my like proofreading and finalization of that. I think I'm going to turn that reading into a podcast. Because I have a lot of thoughts about the Justice League movie that I just can't stop thinking about. Um, so I just wanted to use this as like a way to get it all out there until I eventually cover that movie with a commentary track, hopefully with the guys over at 616. Uh, if you want to see that, visit our Patreon and donate to our DC movies tier where we will record a commentary track with the 616 podcast or 616 entertainment podcast, uh, with those guys over there, Ian and, and his buddies. 
Um, but yeah, let's make that happen because I, I have a lot to say about these movies I need to get off my chest and I think those are the perfect guys to do it with. We've been talking about it for a while, but that's the way to make it happen. So be sure to check out our Patreon. Again, that's www.patreon.com slash shelved. Also, be sure to follow us on Twitter at shelved podcast, Instagram at shelved podcast, and be sure to email us shelved film podcast at gmail.com. And remember to give us those iTunes reviews, five stars, uh, email them to shellfilmpodcast at gmail.com for proof. The first two get their pick of the two digital movie codes I have for Saban's Power Rangers or Fast and Furious 6. So that's going to be it for today's episode. Be sure to check back next week for that Justice League analysis. And then the week after should have a very special interview for you guys. So, all right, be sure to check back and thanks for listening. <laughs>